Good evening, and welcome to the Viaduct Northbound Project Webinar hosted by the Rhode Island Department of Transportation. My name is Sam Guglielmi, and I conduct community outreach for the state of Rhode Island through our Project Management Division. RIDOT is continuing public involvement for our roadworks projects during the COVID-19 pandemic. For this meeting, we're going to pro provide an overview of this project and why it needs to be addressed. With that said, we are absolutely thrilled to show you the design of what the proposed traffic alignment will look like at the completion of this project. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know the format of tonight's event. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Throughout the broadcast, we'd like to ask you to participate in answering a few questions to obtain your feedback. As an attendee of this webinar, you have the ability to submit questions to tonight's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of tonight's presentation. Please note that all attendees will be muted for the duration of this program. Tonight's presenters will include myself, representing business and community outreach, Anthony Pompey will also be joining me from our project management division who oversees the entire completion of this project. As well as Matthew D'Angelo, Alexandra Sue, and Erica Blonde representing HNTB design firm. Tyler Cole from Skanska Manafort will be representing the construction management operations for when the shovels hit the ground. I'd just like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors and partnerships with the entities you see on your screen. Funding for this project has been provided by the efforts of our congressional leadership. So I'd like to specifically recognize the efforts of Senators Jack Reed and Sheldon Whitehouse, as well as Congressman David Cicilline and Jim Langevin. Through their leadership, we can now work to achieve the same goal of improving a major portion of the I-95 corridor that is long overdue for safety and traffic modifications. Together, we can deliver a new and improved transportation system that meets the weight of the present day traffic demand. Now to kick things off, let's cover what we'll be discussing tonight. First, we're going to get familiar with what locations on this project are expected for reconstruction. Then, we're gonna take a step back and review a little history of the Providence Viaduct. We'll review what exactly is going to be happening over the next few years, along with the scheduling and phasing when construction begins. Then we'll wrap up the webinar by providing you with useful resources and tools you can use to keep up to date with the progress throughout the duration of this project. When we arrive at the Q&A portion of the webinar, we'll select a handful of questions to read out loud. If you don't hear your question read out loud, don't worry. Every question that is submitted tonight will be answered in writing and will be posted on the project page on the RIDOT website within about two weeks. I'm now going to give it over to Anthony Pompey, the project manager for the Viaduct Northbound Reconstruction Project. Thank you everybody and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Great, thank you, Sam. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. As Sam mentioned, we're going to start with a review of the general project location and background information. The I-95 Viaduct Northbound project was located in and around the Interstate 95 corridor in downtown Providence. The southern limit of the project is near the Washington Street overpass at, at the exit to Broadway, and the project work extends over a mile to just beyond the Charles Street underpass north of the exit to Route 146. Along this stretch, there are several locations where our project work will be focused, including from north to south, the Atwells Avenue overpass and on-ramp to 95 North, the main interchange and ramp area where the Providence Viaduct carries 95 over the ramps, 
to and from Route 6 and 10 in downtown Providence, as well as Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, the Wenasquatucket River, and several local city streets. Moving north, the project also includes the replacement of the Smith Street overpass and the reconstruction of the retaining walls between 95 and Park Street. And at the northern limit of the project, the interchange with Route 146 North will also be reconfigured with a new bridge being constructed to carry traffic heading towards 146 North over the I-95 travel lanes. The existing Providence Viaduct was originally constructed back in the 60s to carry I-95 through downtown Providence. Originally constructed to carry less than 60,000 vehicles per day, this corridor now processes nearly four times that amount, making it the third most traveled section of interstate in all of New England. Adding to that, the geometric deficiencies of the ramp system, forcing vehicles to weave and merge to access their desired destinations, this corridor has easily become the most congested section of highway in the state, with queues regularly stretching up to two miles during peak commuting periods. Carrying significantly more traffic than initially designed has also led to the accelerated deterioration of the bridge structures as well. Due to these structural deficiencies, RIDOT has conducted bi-monthly bridge inspections of the viaduct and performed several emergency repairs just to keep the structure safely open to traffic, adding considerable expenses to our maintenance budget. Design efforts to replace the viaduct began more than a decade ago with the original intention of replacing both northbound and southbound at the same time. Due to budgetary constraints, it was split into two projects, with the southbound reconstruction occurring first, being completed in 2017. In the summer of 2019, Rideout was successful in obtaining a competitive federal grant of the value of more than $60 million. These additional funds allowed for the advertising of this project in November 2019 that addresses the chronic traffic congestion issues in addition to the structural ones in a way that otherwise would not have been possible. Through a competitive design build procurement process, the contract was awarded this past July. We're currently progressing our design efforts for this project with initial construction activities expected to begin later this winter and into next spring, which we'll get into some greater detail in just a little bit. Based on the significant issues with the current conditions on this section of interstate, we've developed the overall project goals seen here. Providing geometric improvements to the interchange will serve to reduce traffic congestion through the site while enhancing safety for all users by eliminating conflicting merges and weaving movements. And secondly, addressing the serious deficiencies in the condition of the existing structures through replacement or rehabilitation will bring this critical interstate segment up to a state of good repair helping the state come closer to meeting its overall program goals by reducing the inventory of structurally deficient bridges. During the life of this project, our overall project goals can be broken down into short-term goals realized during construction and long-term goals, which begin with the completion of the project and extend for its useful service life over the next 75 plus years. During construction of this project, our primary goals are to maintain existing travel access for all types of users throughout the corridor as much as possible, reducing or eliminating potential public safety risks as a result of construction operations, and minimizing necessary detours and temporary parking impacts to local city streets to the maximum extent possible. Upon completion of the project, or sooner where possible, our major goals include the re reduction of traffic incidents by addressing safety concerns through primarily geometric improvements, improving the condition of the infrastructure to a state of good repair for years to come, and significantly reducing congestion and associated emissions through the entire area. And with that, I'm now gonna turn it back over to Sam, who's gonna take everyone through our first polling question of the night. Sam. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Let's get rolling here. I'm now going to submit the first poll question for the night. It'll pop up on your screen momentarily. The first poll question reads, what do you consider to be the most important project goal? First answer is to minimize tra travel disruptions during construction, improve condition of infrastructure to a state of good repair, and lastly, reduced traffic congestion and admission upon completion. I'll give everybody a few moments to submit their responses and we'll wrap up this poll.
Looks like about half of you have voted, so let's give it a, probably another 10 seconds and we'll wrap this up. All right, let's see the results. It looks like the majority of you chose the third option, which is reduced traffic congestion and emissions upon completion. Thank you everybody for participating in that and let me uh, close this poll. Okay, go ahead, Matt. All right, great, thanks, Sam. Uh, let's take a let's take a minute and let's just discuss the overall scope for the project here. Um, like Anthony and Sam already outlined a little bit of the DOT's background, the project need, their project development, some of the early steps in the process. Um, but what we want to talk about and cover briefly here tonight is the requirements that drive the design, really drive that design, drive the construction, and the finished product that we'll see take shape over the next few years. So as we all know, a, a basic need for the investment, Anthony, I think you mentioned it already in an early slide, is to replace the aging northbound side of the viaduct <clears throat> and the associated ramp bridges. Right, it's that replacement, that rehabilitation, the preservation work of that existing main line and the approach set of structures that Atwells and Smith and 146 and a handful of others, that's really gonna help the DOT meet its roadworks program goals by reducing the state's inventory of structurally deficient bridges. So the work includes demolition and reconstruction of bridge and highway infrastructure over those project limits that Angela, uh, Anthony mentioned earlier. Uh, it will accommodate operational and safety improvements through bridge and roadway widening for an important new collector distributor roadway and access from east and west heading northward to 146, the state offices and further north out of Providence at the north end of the project. Project will ultimately reduce those travel congestion, uh, reduce tra traffic congestion through the site and, and, uh, and improve travel times and safety by eliminating those current conflicts, the on and off ramp weaving movements and merges that you see there today. The work will also be done to minimize to the maximum extent practical the impacts to all existing users. So we know that this area is highly congested, it's heavily traveled. And so it's important that adding a major reconstruction project to the area is done with consideration for continuous access to those major areas of the project. And with as little impact as possible, and that's something Alex is going to speak to in the coming slides related to traffic phasing and potential detours and construction sequencing. So to that end, and if you, you know, pull it down a couple, uh, Sam and Erica, um, to that end, the DOT, as Anthony mentioned, we're advancing this project using design build procurement. And what that does, it allows for a more streamlined and efficient uh, design and construction process. It allows that direct collaboration with the DOT and it accelerates completion with this method of procurement. So tonight, our design and construction team has cleared the preliminary design phase and the graphic here on the screen is, is, is indicative of the overall project scope and construction improvements. Currently, as of today, we're advancing towards a final design and we'll do so through, through the spring and summer of next year uh, in 2021 and planning on completing this $265 million construction in the summer of 2025. <clears throat> so what we'll start with uh, quick, is a quick note to focus on some of those key areas of the project that Anthony mentioned earlier. You know, our plan during the early phases of design was to break the project into a few distinct areas of construction and targeted improvements. Now, of course, there's plenty more in and around the areas highlighted here. And if the folks in attendance tonight have questions or comments related to any design or construction not shown uh, within this slide deck as a brief overview, the design team, the construction joint venture were available to discuss at the end of the overview. So we'll walk through north south and north which is left to right on your screen on uh, this image and started at wells like anthony mentioned and the northbound on-ramp from dave gavitt the on-ramp will be replaced and realigned to meet our new wider collector distributor road and provide that same vehicle and pedestrian accommodations you see there today uh, north to the interchange and ramps the design will include structure widening replacement over the major east-west movements and also in and around the river the amtrak northeast corridor and those local roads at Promenade and Providence Place. 
on Step North is Par uh, Park Street, and the design there provides for a new retaining wall construction on the east side of I-95, both north and south of Smith Street. And at Smith itself, but the project will include a new two-span bridge crossing and the replacement there with some added architectural treatment and decorative lighting through to the intersection on the east. And at 146 and Orms, up at the north end of the project, one of the major focus areas was to maintain accessibility to Orms and the state office's exit. <coughs> the design improvements there will include a new bridge crossing at 146 and a northerly connection back to I-95 for traffic carry from the south all the way back at Atwell's and from the east and west ramp connections. So on the next slide, let's take a minute on each one of these areas just to highlight a key, uh, a few, uh, a few key points <laughs> at each one of these areas. So let's start with Atwell's on the southern end of the job. At the top of the screen, the image shows the current or, or existing conditions of the on-ramp. That existing structure carries northbound traffic away from Dave Gavin at the south approach and in Atwell's, uh, in Atwell's traffic east from Broadway and the Convention Center and west from Federal Hill. The alignment you see there today is a straight carry through the intersection <clears throat> over a long multi-span bridge structure merging with the I-95 up at the north end. And again, the basic need here is structure replacement. And the goal, as with everything else on the job, is to construct for added longevity and safety for the project. So one particular note in a recall of the DOT's focus on minimal construction impacts. So in order to replace that bridge, that long bridge that you have out there today in the same footprint and still maintain traffic operations, <clears throat> we have either a temporary crossing, a temporary bridge construction erected offline of the existing, or we'd have to reconstruct that bridge in a staged or half and half type of construction. Now, both options there extend the construction duration and the travel impacts to users. So instead, the proposed design, and that's the image at the bottom of the screen, you see the new on-ramp, it introduces a slight sweep into the final alignment to keep both temporary traffic moving through the intersection while also allowing for construction offline, again, with limited impacts to existing bridge and service to the I-95 main line. <clears throat> we know there's a fair bit of traffic, uh, truck traffic that comes from Matt Wells. And so the design will certainly appropriate sufficient width of the new crossing and single the signal function to allow the same level of service for trucks turning and heading to nor uh, north to 146 and I-95. The design will also <coughs> maintain pedestrian and ADA accommodations with reconstructed crosswalks and joints and island ramps for continuous safe passage of non-vehicular travel. Moving northward one step uh, over to the interchange. <coughs> the design here calls for replacement of the northbound viaduct. And what you see here is much of the same as what was recently built over on the southbound side of the project uh, just a few years ago. It'll be a multi-span steel girder structure for the main line and curved steel structure ramps from Route 610 at the west and from downtown at the east. Important point here, ramps will be constructed offline and that's gonna minimize those traffic impacts, especially from downtown, and also reduces the work over Amtrak, that northeast corridor and the river area and pulls that alignment for the ramps slightly away from the wall area. Now what is new, however, on this slide, you can see it, is an additional two lanes will be built into that cross section for added capacity and function. It's going to be added into the replaced roadway cross section and providing a means to both stage the bridge construction today and maintain four lanes of travel in the interim conditions. This gives us a new wider collector distributor roadway, something I mentioned just a moment ago. Adding that new collector distributor roadway allows a more efficient a set of connections from Atwell's and the ramps and reduces that problematic weaving, as he mentioned earlier, that problematic weaving and the merging downstream of the connections as vehicles jockey for position towards their final destinations at I-95 and 146 upwards towards Orange and State. Again, a step to the north <coughs> at Park Street. And if we slide forward, please. At Park Street, the major, the majority of the work comes in the form of retaining wall installation and rehabilitation. The proposed design work along that east side of I-95 northbound will include a slight realignment of the existing Park Street wall and installation of a new soldier pile and lagging, a robust uh, type of construction that will minimize excavation and that buried utility risk that we have underneath Park Street. 
The wall will be faced also to provide an architectural finish similar to that's out there existing today. And one forward over at Smith Street, and even though the images don't hit it specifically, if you page forward one, <coughs> the DOT's proposed a bridge replacement that includes provisions for aesthetic treatment. And that's important. We know that this is a highly visible area in and around the State House. And as such, the replacement bridge at Smith will build on the traditional structure and detailing that this uh, from the DOT and it will include the city's decorative light standards and poles, architectural safety fencing over the bridge, and those stately end posts or pylons to finish the end of the bridge with a more of a gateway type of feel. And the pylons there, you have that black and white image, more of a, um, a sketchy type of image. Those pylons are pretty robust, uh, nearly 14 feet high. And so it'll feel like more of a, a gateway type of approach in and around that area of the intersection. It's important to know many of the details are still in development here tonight. Again, we're at the preliminary design phase and preliminary design level. It's important to mention the intent tonight. The work, as the work is developed and as we, uh, as we introduce more of those architectural details and we build our, our design towards the final design phases over the next spring and summer, Anthony and team, I imagine, can, can post uh, our, our applicable renderings and design development and aesthetic detailing to, right to the project site for available uh, for public uh, use. <clears throat> and finally, stepping up one, uh, one last step to the north, up at the north end of the project, this is really where the design comes together and you can get a good look at the major differences between the existing and the proposed work, again, top and bottom on your screen. But remember, we're adding a new separated collector distributor road through to the project but we still need to restore all those connections for traffic heading northbound from Atwell's and east and west at the interchange. And so the project, a uh, major element of the project, will include realigning and replacing 146 uh, to the inside of the curve, the current uh, bridge curve that you see there today. And we're gonna squeeze everything together on that, those, that roadway footprint, we'll squeezing everything together a little bit more efficiently and reallocating that old footprint, that old 146 off-ramp footprint to fit a new two lane at grade ramp connection back to 95 up at the northern limits of the project. The proposed design here collects and carries six lanes of traffic all the way through to the northern end of the project. So on the next couple of slides, we'll just take a, a, a quick minute to walk through the dis distribution from west to east or left to right on the screen. As we see here on the, on the screen now, the, 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 the westernmost limits of the northbound side, that's that darker colored pavement, uh, over on the on, on the right half, we'll start with those two uh, I-95 through lanes. That's highlighted in orange right there. And what you have there is a true separated express lane experience with no merges, no weaves, starting all the way back uh, just south before Ratwells, where Exit 23 will actually be installed. One step to the east, our realigned 146, what we just talked about. That realigned 146 comes with a new bridge crossing uh, up and over I-95, again, eliminating an older deficient structure that was just recently under repair. Next step to the east, that's our new two-lane upgrade ramp, and that's right in the footprint of the existing 146 roadway. And then finally, the last step to the east, we complete the section with maintained access to Orm Street and the state offices. And that's important to note here, because even though we're adding capacity, we're adding some width and operational improvements, that section widening stops there. There's no net impact as we make our way east, uh, introducing any additional right of way or land takings or impacts there. And so those are just the basics of what you'll see for changes and improvements uh, over the course of the next couple of years. Alex is gonna spend a little time now talking uh, about traffic impacts and when you'll likely see them um, as the design takes shape uh, into construction. Thank you, Matt. I'm gonna go over the general construction sequencing, focusing on a few of the traffic impacts that you may encounter. As Matt mentioned, there'll be some points during this work where some temporary closures and detours will be required. So in order to minimize traffic impacts, all of the detours are being assessed to make sure that they can handle any increase in traffic and also a traffic monitoring program is being implemented to make sure that any unforeseen issues are addressed quickly. So in stage one, we'll begin in the spring of 2021 and will last about a year and a half. Construction will begin with the rehabilitation of some of the existing bridges and demo of that old southbound viaduct that sits in the center of the interchange between the northbound and southbound traffic. 
Now, all travel lanes um, during this stage on 95 will remain open um, during the peak period. For the rehabilitation of the Atwells Avenue Bridge that you see on the, on the left side of the screen, there will also be some short-term lane closures on the bridge segment over 95. Inbound traffic towards downtown will remain open with um, a detour for all traffic going westbound over the highway. Now, this detour is expected to last about one to two months. There will be work on the Park Street Bridge over the river as well, as you see in the center of the screen. Um, one travel lane over the bridge will remain open during, during the construction, um, during the daytime and peak travel periods, but there will be full closures of the bridge at nighttime where there will be a detour in place. Um, on I-95, um, on the bridges over Ashburton Street and Charles Street, they'll also be undergoing some repairs over there with short-term nighttime only lane closures on, on the highway um, in the northbound and southbound directions in order to do um, some of the repairs to the bridge joint. So after the preservation work and demo is complete, work on building part of the new northbound viaduct where the old southbound uh, structure used to be um, that will begin. All of the existing number of travel lanes will stay open during the peak traffic periods, um, but there will be some short-term closures on Park Street in order to allow for the highway widening and some of that wall work that was mentioned earlier. The closures are anticipated to happen in phases. The section between Hayes and Avenue of the Arts will be closed for about a month, and the section between Avenue, Art, uh, Avenue of the Arts and Smith will be closed for another month. However, these two sections won't be closed at the same time. Smith Street will also be re reconstructed in phases, one side at a time, in order to maintain two-way traffic on the bridge um, with one lane in open in each direction. And then moving north, we'll also begin work on the new Route 146 northbound bridge. Both travel lanes will remain open during the day with potential for closing one lane um, at nighttime to do some of that construction. Moving on to stage two, go to the next slide, Sam. Um, it will begin in the fall of 2022 and last for about a year. Uh, traffic on 95 northbound will be shifted to the new uh, partially constructed northbound viaduct that was built in the last stage. However, the same number of existing travel lanes that are out there today will remain open um, during the peak traffic periods. There will be some short-term nighttime only closures for the Atwells Avenue on-ramp um, due to that construction there. Um, that will only be done you know, in the middle of the night, so there shouldn't be any significant traffic impacts. Um, on Route 146 northbound, there'll be a short duration of time where um, the two lanes that are currently uh, go over uh, I-95 will be split with one travel lane open on the existing bridge and another one open on the partially constructed new uh, 146 bridge. Again, um, nighttime closures of one of the travel lanes may be necessary, um, but nighttime only. Uh, for the ramp that connects 610 to 95 northbound, most of that new structure will be built with no impacts to the existing ramp traffic. However, there will be some short-term nighttime only closures of the ramp in order to tie in the existing infrastructure um, to the new structure. Detours, again, will only happen at night. There will also need to be some short-term closures with detours for the Route 146 northbound ramp. Um, it is anticipated that this work will only require full closures of the ramp for, for a few weekends, um, but all ramp travel lanes will be open to traffic during the weekday peak periods. In stage three, it is anticipated to begin of fall of 2023 and last about one and a half years. During this stage, the interchange is actually pretty close to being in the final configuration. Uh, the ramp from Memorial Boulevard to 95 Northbound will be reconstructed at this time. While most of the construction will not impact existing travel, there will be um, some short-term closures for about a month in order to tie in the existing infrastructure into the new structure and the new collector distributor road. There will also be lane closures on 95 northbound to allow for the construction of the median between the main line and the new collector distributor road. But um, however, since the roadway was widened, um, 95 northbound will maintain the same number of open travel lanes during the peak periods as is currently out there today. And then finally, 
um, the last things to do um, are really to demolish the existing ramp from downtown now that the new ramp is completed. Um, we don't anticipate any impact to traffic during this work. Um, also, final paving and pavement markings so the project uh, will, area will be finished up, and any lane closures due to this work will be done during the off-peak hours. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Sam for the second poll question. Thank you, Alex. Let's get this second poll question launched. Okay. The question we're asking you tonight is, what is your primary reason for traveling through this corridor? First question we're gonna ask you is, do you access it to go to and from routes six and 10 or route 146? Second question is, are you continuing through Providence on I-95? Or are you using it to access to and from the downtown Providence and local neighborhoods? So I'll give you a few moments to submit your, your responses and we'll close this poll. Looks like about 85% of you have voted, so we'll give it another 10 seconds and we'll wrap this up. All right, I'm gonna close this poll now. Okay, the results are, it looks like most of you have chosen to access to and from downtown Providence in the local neighborhoods. So thank you for that feedback. I'm gonna close this poll. Okay, moving on. Okay, so for reoccurring updates and to stay informed about the progress that has been made, we encourage you to visit the Viaduct Northbound Project page on the RIDOT website. By entering your email address in the box at the bottom of the page, you'll receive email updates as the project progresses. A shortcut link will be provided in a follow-up email to everyone that attended tonight's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, this meeting will be recorded and posted on the project page so if you missed a part of the presentation or just want to rewatch it, you can take a look back at any time. So before we wrap up our presentation and begin to take some of your questions, I'd like to leave my contact information on the screen so that if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to me at either my cell phone number or my email address, and I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. All right. We have now reached the Q&A portion of this webinar. This will give you a chance to submit any last minute questions in the question pane on the control panel located on the side of your screen. At this time, I'd like to ask Anthony, Matt, Alexandra, Erica, and myself to turn on our webcams for this portion of the presentation. I'd just like to reiterate that what I mentioned earlier, every one of your questions will be answered and submitted in writing on the project page for your reference. So if you would like to exit now during this portion of the webinar, we have finished showing our presentation. This part of the broadcast will be dedicated for providing more in-depth answers to any questions you have for what you saw this evening. Thanks, Sam. So we'll start with a question about um, abutter notifications and uh, neighborhood communication. So the question is, good evening, and thank you for conducting the presentation. When will you be scheduling meetings with the abutting stakeholders to review specific designs, construction logistics, and impacts on pedestrian and vehicular traffic on Promenade Street? Thanks. So Sam, that, that actually, um, you're, you're really the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> Sam Guglielmi is our business community outreach liaison. He provided his information just on the last slide. Um, if you missed it, like we said, the presentation is going to be posted on our website. There it is again. He is certainly the one to reach out to. Um, he's very great at getting back to everyone who looks for um, information. He'll certainly reach out to me and my team, and we'd be happy to meet with um, anyone really on the project. So um, I encourage you to reach out to him and um, we'll get in touch. Great. So the next question is on the Atwell's intersection geometry. So the question is, could you provide detail on the Atwell section uh, inter intersection geometry? It appears that the pedestrian crossing distance headed westbound is longer than needed. 
it would be preferable to have as short of a crossing as possible with curb radii, such that traffic is slowed and encouraged to respect pedestrians. So that one I would um, toss over to Matt. Yeah, I, and, and I'll, I'll do the same right over to, to Alex, because I know you said you spent a little time looking at this very thing, and um, I'm not sure if we should pull up a, a, a slide just to kind of um, show a little opportunity to walk through some of the um, the imagery that we have instead of just leaving it on this slide. Uh, Sam, if you can page back, maybe just to the Atwells area, and then um, and kind of Alex, you can talk it through. Yeah, I'm looking for it. There we go. This one you want, or you want another one? Yeah, I think that I think that'll do. You want to restate the restate the question? Sure. So the question was, could you provide details on the Atwell's intersection geometry? It appears that the pedestrian crossing distance headed westbound is longer than needed. It would be preferable to have as short of a crossing as possible with curb radii such that traffic is slowed and encouraged to respect pedestrians. So I would say, so to, just to start the conversation, and I know Alex, I don't know if you're on mute there, but, but you know, this is preliminary design, right? And part of this, you know, part of this exercise is to field questions just like this. And so, so to, to improve the, the intersection geometry, you know, I know as recently as this afternoon, we've been working through some other details here. Anthony, you're nodding yes. Um, you know, so what you're seeing on the screen is one iteration of that. You know, it's developed over the last couple of months. Uh, and that's changed somewhat just in the last, I would say, two weeks or so. Um, and so obviously, as we develop from 30% into 90% over the next month or two here, you're going to see revised details there, and that's certainly something that that uh, we have looked at. Um, just obviously the, the maintenance of traffic, both uh, vehicular and pedestrian, that's really important here. So, um, Alex, I'll let you add on the crosswalks and the lengths there too for wheelchair ramps. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we're we're definitely trying to you know refine the design in order to make the pedestrian crossing um, as short as possible. However, there are some there are some larger trucks that do need to travel through this area, um, and we may want to maintain that access. But um, as you see on the screen in the bottom, uh, we're trying to balance the, the length of the crosswalk and where we're shifting um, the ramp a little bit to to the west, um, and and making that island as large as possible um, in yeah. order to facilitate short shortening that that crossing as well. Um, but all of the all of the traffic signal um, operations will also be optimized in order to maintain um, uh, sufficient crossing uh, times across that crosswalk, as well as trying to shorten it as much as possible. Okay. So the next question we have is, will there be any improvements on the Orm Street Bridge for pedestrians? So I can uh, take that one. The, the Orm Street Bridge, the, the structure itself was replaced um, relatively recently, certainly much more recently than any of the other bridges. So that's one of the few along this corridor that were actually is not part of the scope of this project. Um, we're not touching it at all other than you know, repaving 95 going underneath it. So um, the Orm Street would not be part of the, the scope of this job. Okay. The next question I have is, how will you make the Smith Street Bridge more pedestrian friendly and will it be shoveled when it snows in the winter? Will it be a place where puddles accumulate so all pedestrians get sprayed every time a car goes by? Hmm. So I can um, touch on it and then I'll, I'll probably give it to, to Matt. Um, the, the final design about um, you know pedestrians and bicycle access over the bridge, that, that's certainly like Matt mentioned, we're just finishing preliminary design, heading towards final design. All those discussions are currently really just starting and, and getting um, getting underway. We're gonna be, we've already started some coordination with the city of Providence. Um, who has obviously say over all the, the city streets in the area. They have their own public <laughs> outreach process. Um, I'm sure many of you have been involved there if you're on the meeting now. Um, so we'll be going to them. They know they have several public meetings. Once we have, we get the feedback from everyone involved and we'll make sure our design certainly aligns with the city's plans 
Uh, I know they have a lot of big plans for um, pedestrian bicycle access running through many of the city streets, um, Smith Street included. So we're going to make sure our design kind of blends well and, and certainly doesn't prevent anything they're looking to do with the area. Um, yeah, yeah, that that that's important, right? You know, I would agree. You know, the the design itself obviously is part of the project. You know, the, the interest is replacing the infrastructure for today, but also not to preclude future opportunities there, right? And biking pedestrian access is really important to the DOT in the city. So, as far as getting sprayed, um, you know, and having you know uh, an unpleasure. Uh, 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 unpleasurable experience as you walk through there right that, that's something that is part of the design right so we're uh, the, the bridge profile itself will be accommodated we're obviously the drainage design and spread off the curb line now those are the things that we build into the design just naturally so we have positive drainage in and away from the curb lines um, you know, as far as snow shoveling, um, personally, I, I don't know if I'm going to be shoveling the snow off of the bridge, but uh, um, you know, maybe I'll let the DOT um, talk about just ongoing maintenance, and that's something the city is certainly uh, is certainly responsible for. Great, and we actually have another question related to uh, to rainfall. So here is the question: Is are there any design considerations for pedestrian cyclist experience for walking under the viaduct on Promenade Street or Pro Providence Place? I walk and bike under there regularly, and when it's raining, a waterfall effect can sometimes occur, meaning I either have to wade into the roadway, people drive too fast, or get drenched with runoff from the roadway. So I can again start off. Um, this is again this is a very strong coordination efforts with the city of Providence. Um, I don't know how many people on on this chat right now is aware, but um, the city does have a pretty significant project underway now called the Winnesquatucket Greenway. Um, project that will be adding some significant pedestrian bicycle facilities um, down the length of Promenade, really from, from Park Street right at Providence Place Mall, running all the way down to Eagle Square, um, running along the river. So there'd be some significant upgrades coming on there. They're, they're looking, to, they're advancing their design now. They've, they're going through the public um, process right now as well. So they're going to be working together with them. We'll be out there <laughs> relatively the same time. So um, we'll be getting everything going. So again, that'll be strong coordination with, with the city, um, specifically under Promenade. We're also working with them. We've incorporated some some designs and changes um, to help you know, work with that design, further the design, you know, increasing some space under there, opening up some more room for pedestrians and, and to get their design moving. Um, I don't know if Matt has any, do you have anything else to add, but that's. Yeah, not much, uh, you know, other than the, the reference to the Winaspatucket, uh, the, the Greenway Enhancements Project is important. Uh, as far as that waterfall effect off of the old structure, you know, we're replacing that aging viaduct. So, you know, if, it, if it's a, a situation where it's that, you know, that maintenance concern, you know, with the existing joints being uh, open and some of the drainage connections not being made, you know, that's all part of that project to close that up. And we are pulling that that alignment together, right? So we're really going to have a complete seal over the top, uh, and then you know, as designed, all that water, you know, from a profile effect uh, into the curb lines and off the bridge, you know, that's a that's a design consideration here to manage that water in and around uh, the viaduct, both top and bottom. Great. So there's some questions around uh, concern about um, noise. So the question is, will there be any pile driving at night? Uh, we are concerned about residents complaining. So that, that's certainly a lesson we learned from the southbound project. Uh, that's something they worked through at the time. Um, we did incorporate that into our plans um, through the design build process. We we're looking for some some innovative techniques and, and methods that could help avoid that. So I'll, I'll let Matt kind of get into some of the details they're they're proposing. Yeah, this might this might be a good one for for Tyler. Um, you know, so Tyler, you know, obviously for pile installation, we have a mix of of driven piles, which again, you know, for from a vibratory standpoint, you know, that's the majority of that installation. It's not just a, a complete hammer driving, you know, for the full length of the pile. So a lot of that is vibratory. Um, and then we're using, you know, some uh, some other pile sections um, like my drilled micro piles, right? And so the drilling operation is really important there too, right? It's a type of pile that you can drill in, and it's it's more effective at, at noise uh, mitigation as well, right? Because we don't have that hammering effect over and over, as I know some folks have seen in the past. Tyler, anything to add on that? 
No, as far as means and methods, you uh, you counter that pretty well. Is um, we eliminate some of the the noise by vibration. Uh, the majority of the pile is vibrated in and it impacted uh, subsequent to that to reach the design strength. Um, one other thing you can touch on, Matt, is uh, through our design, uh, we improved the design to actually limit a lot of structure. So um, what, what that does is actually remove a lot of noise and that's going to be that was to be anticipated by uh, reducing a significant amount of piles. Um, compared to the original design uh, by skinning the structure that was earlier meant uh, naturally reduce that uh, length of, of construction and the quantity of piles to be driven. Great. So another question is, will Park Street be open to pedestrians during the day at all times? I can answer that one. Um, yes, during construction, when um, when Park Street is going to be closed in those two phases that I mentioned, um, pedestrian access will be open during that entire time. Perfect. Then I've got another question in the queue here about closures of local city roads and more specifically any that would impact pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, will there be a structure to protect these road users from potential falling debris during construction on Promenade Street and Providence Place? I, I can I can fill that one. Yeah. So so um there's a few operations that have a potential of, of uh, things that are being suspended in the air. And, and so that is demolition and erection of uh, superstructure. So to accommodate these, uh, these, these potential fall hazards, uh, Skanska and Manafort have strict protocols for safety. And one of those is we'll have lagging um, in areas that have potential effect. Um, and also for demolition, these, we, these, operations will be done what during street closures for the majority um, to eliminate eliminate any of uh, potential effects of, of harming individuals yeah those areas are those areas are going to be closely controlled right so Tyler said you know we have we have shielding that'll be installed under those bridges during the, the heaviest demolition operations just to protect those users below <clears throat> great um, Sam, I'm going to hand it back over to you uh, to, to finish up and um, like you said, we'll answer all questions uh, in written format. Great. Thank you, Erica. Okay, so it looks like we've reached the end of this town hall. On behalf of all of us at RIDOT, HNTV, and Scans to Manafort, I want to extend our thanks to you for joining us here tonight. We hope the information that was presented provides a clear outlook of how things will be improved over the next few years. Okay, so thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.